for the first time ever, Riot has reset the ladder in the middle of the season to mark the start of Split 2. And whenever the ladder is reset, all the best players in the world try their hardest to rush the top of the leaderboards. In fact, unless you've been living under a rock, a ton of Westerners even traveled to Korea for this exact reason. Try and get the top ranking on the hardest server in the world, Korea. Well, we here at Skillcap have been paying close attention to this climb, and boy, did we catch someone accomplishing an incredible feat. There was a player who had the highest win rate in Korean Challenger, 76%, while being rank 5 on the entire server. To put into context how insane that is, the second highest win rate in Korean Challenger was 66%, a full 10% lower. And keep in mind, the average Korean Challenger has a win rate percentage in the 50s. Breaking 60% is considered very impressive, but hitting 76% while also being rank 5 is just unheard of. The craziest part though is this was a support player. Yes, a support player has the highest win rate in the highest ranking on the hardest server in the world. So who is this guy? Well, he's actually a Korean pro player known as Moham who plays for the pro team KDF. In this guide, we're going to be walking you through step by step everything he's doing to absolutely stomp solo queue, starting from the very first minute of the laning phase all the way to how he gets the Nexus to explode. And speaking of winning ranked games, if you want to radically accelerate your progress in League of Legends, there's nothing better than our hyper improvement platform at skillcap.com. We have the highest number of courses on the internet covering literally everything you need to master the game. Live commentaries where a challenger player teaches you how to escape the exact rank you're stuck in and one-on-one -on -one coaching. We've got all the tools to supercharge your improvement. The best part, our service is completely risk-free to try as you're kept safe with rank up insurance. If you don't significantly improve while actively using Skillcap, then you get your money back, no questions asked. Click the link in the description below to start improving fast and get the rank you've always wanted. Now, back to the guide. So first we'll begin with a standard level two all-in Moham uses all the time to get a lead literally in the first few minutes of the game. When playing a champion that has relic charges, the worst mistake you can make is using them on the first wave like this enemy Rakan. Instead, you want to do as Moham does, save all of your charges for the second wave. You see, on the second wave, after all the melee minions die, you're going to hit level two. So start by killing one of the melees with the charge, and then out of the last two melees, focus the one with the largest health lead. Your relic charges will execute minions below 50% health, so wait for your AD carry to last hit the second melee minion alive. Then as soon as they do, use your execute to pop the third melee and spike level 2 on your opponent. Here's another typical example with Moham on Rakan. Saves both relic charges for the second wave. Once the second wave arrives, start focusing down one melee minion to use the charge on, let your AD carry focus down another melee, and execute the third with your last stack to spike level 2 and all in your opponent. This is one of the most most typical ways he'd win his lane in the first minute. He does do a variation though, when you already cemented yourself a massive push lead at level 1. You can see here, as the second wave arrives, Moham is on Rakan and already has a big minion lead. In this case, there's no need to use both your charges to rush level 2, since you'll already hit level 2 first, no matter what. Instead, just use one charge, and save the other one instead, while zoning the opponent. The reason you want to do this is that it will give you an extra charge to use on the third minion wave. And as this third minion wave arrives, the worst outcome to have is the opponent thin your wave out, and then and set up a freeze as it can lead to you being overextended during a common gank timing. You can see this in action on the third wave, he uses a charge on one melee and then the last charge on the siege minion. This was actually very key in preventing this gank from the enemy. As you can see, the enemy bot lane is hesitant to continue running through a giant wave they've created, forcing Rengar to just run away wasting his time. Now, before we jump into what to do when you're on the losing end of this, we should highlight how fighting for early lane brush control is a key part of Moham's playstyle. You want to imagine each three lane brushes as steps you want to climb. In this case, the enemy wasn't in lane early enough to contest the first brush, so we just skip immediately to the second middle brush. Now our goal is to try and get control of the third brush, which the enemy Rakan mistakenly doesn't try to fight over. You can see how much pressure this will put on the enemy AD carry, since at any point you're threatening to land a key ability on them. Sometimes though, the enemy will try to fight over that brush, for example here he's playing Rakan. He starts again by trying to get control of the middle brush. The reason he isn't walking into the furthest one is he's worried the enemy could be standing in it and looking to cheese him. It's only once he sees the enemy walking back to lane from leashing does he know they're not in that brush, and so begins looking to try and get control of it. You can see how he's trying to use his range advantage against Alistar to sneak autos in, but Alistar eventually pushes him out of the brush threatening a pulverize. So at this point, you can't face check the brush or you're going to get pulverized by Alistar, and so you have to concede control over it and play from the middle brush. However, once it's clear they will hit level 2 first, you can see how he immediately then uses that to take control of the furthest brush once again. And this finally leads on how to play when you do lose that early push advantage. So here, Moham is on Rel, and gets to lane later than the enemy bot lane due to having to leash. You can see the enemy 
Khan starts by controlling the furthest brush. Moham tries to fight for control over it, but the enemy's spacing is too good, and with Rakan's higher auto attack range, they're able to push him out of the brush. At the same time, they've cemented the minion lead by the second wave. In these positions, you have to make sure you don't fall for that level 2 all-in we just went over. Instead, stand far back so you're just in max experience range and wait for the wave to crash into your tower. This way, you won't lose your lane immediately, like we saw what happened with the enemy Nautilus. This also leads into the next timing he uses quite a bit to win his lane, the level 3 spike. So, bot laners will hit level 3 on the 4th minion wave. There are two easy ways for you to memorize this. The first is that it's the wave at the 3 minute mark. 3 minutes equals level 3. The second is that it's the first wave after the siege minion wave. Either way, when the 3 melee minions die on this 4th wave, you're going to hit level 3. So, in this example, pay attention to the melee minions in this wave. Notice how Moham is ahead by 2 melee minions and only needs to kill this last one to spike level 3. The enemy Rakan doesn't realize this and so looks to engage. But since Moham knows this timing, he stands his ground. And right as Rakan engages, we see the last melee minion die spiking them level 3. This immediately sets up a kill on the enemy AD carry. Into then shortly after, Rel being able to kill not only the jungler, but the enemy support as well for a triple kill at the three minute mark. Again, here it's the three minute mark and the fourth wave has arrived. Moham is playing Rakan and uses his one relic charge to kill the first melee. Then notice how he moves forward before his AD carry kills this minion. This way he'll be in position to engage right as they hit level three. A lot of players are aware of the level two timing, but not a lot of players have memorized the level three timing. And so you can win a lot of lanes with this tactic. And the final timing you need to be aware of is the level six spike. You see, if you're ahead in lane, you'll typically always spike level 6 over the opponent first, which is huge since you'll have your ultimate and they won't. The thing is, typically if you are ahead, you'll be the one pushing and have control over the lane, and the opponent will be sitting at their tower safely. Now, there's no way to memorize the timing for this, as a lot can impact how much experience you have by this point. Instead, you just need to pay attention to your XP bar to know when you're about to hit level 6. So, in this example, we can see Rakan is just a minion or two away from spiking level 6. As soon as he notices that he's one minion off and that one minion is about to die, that's when he engages spiking level 6 during his W animation. You can see how being aware of this timing gets him a kill on the enemy AD carry right before a big wave crashes into the tower, causing the enemy AD carry to fall massively far behind. Now, in between these timings, you'll be fighting over brush control as we went over, but you'll also be looking for winning trades. A very simple rule Moham follows is he'll look for trades where he can trade his health as a support with the enemy AD carries. An easy way to visualize this is to draw a triangle on your screen. If you and your AD carry are next to each other, and the enemy AD carry is at the point of the triangle, then you'll want to look to trade. Even though this trade looks like it went even, it's actually hard winning, since the support's health is worth much less than the AD carry's health. This is because AD carries only start with one health pot compared to the support's two, and so have less innate sustain. Additionally, a support will find it easier to recall and regenerate their health in the fountain, since they don't have to be stuck in lane last hitting minions. Again, if we skip forward, you can see how we can draw a triangle where Tristana is at the end point, so we initiate a trade that we easily win. Basically, you want to avoid the mistake of engaging on supports if your AD carry will be the one to take damage in the ensuing trade. For example, here Moham engages on the enemy support, and you can see his AD carry follow using her Q ability on the support. However, with all their abilities on cooldown, Varus now knows he's safe to turn on the AD carry with his autos and ability. You can see how this one mistake can be lane losing. Always be cautious of focusing a support if it will leave your AD carry vulnerable to be traded with. Now, during the landing phase, there are two ideal recall timings you should be aware of that Moham always tries to hit if he can. The first is when he has over five gold. This will allow him to purchase boots and two control wards. So if you have over 500 gold and see a chance to recall off of one of your pushes, definitely take it. The second recall timing is when he can purchase his first boots upgrade and two control wards. In this case, that's boots of lucidity, so he needs over 750 gold. After pushing this wave, he has 830, so he knows to recall for this item spike. And it's worth mentioning, throughout the entire game, whenever he recalls, he'll always try to purchase two control wards if he can't afford it to always keep them on him. This allows him to put one down to clear a ward and then put a second one down later to clear another ward or control an area. I also found a cool trick he uses to help make tower dives way easier for him and his team. If you know you're going to tower dive on the crash, try to flash on the enemy AD carry on the last wave before your minions are under the tower. The intention here is to trade your flash with the enemy AD carry. This way, once you tower dive, the enemy AD carry has no way to outplay the dive by dodging abilities with flash and is just a sitting duck, making it way easier for you. And by the way, if you want to seriously improve your laning, I highly recommend our new course on mastering the laning phase as a support. It will literally teach you everything you need to know from wave management from both the perspectives of caster supports and melee supports, concepts such as playing parallel to your AD carry, abusing brush pressure, denying vision, the list goes on. 
I highly recommend checking it out on our website by clicking the link in the description below. All right, so that lightning section on Moham may seem a bit short, like isn't there something else he's doing in lane to win? Well, there is, but it isn't in his lane. You see, one of Moham's secrets to winning is that he's insanely good at roaming during the laning phase. It all starts with the most standard tactic, the push into roam. So here, Moham is on pike and is about to crash a wave into the tower. Whenever you crash a wave, you should always be taking a look at mid lane to see if you have a roam available. There are several different reasons you have a roam timing here. First is because since you just killed the enemy wave, there's no minions left to last it. So your AD carry doesn't need to be in lane temporarily, meaning it's safe to leave them. The second is that after a big wave crashes into a tower, it's always going to rebound off that tower and push back towards you. This means worst case scenario, if you're late to get back to lane, your AD carry can always just play safe and wait for the wave to push back to him while losing minimal CS. And thirdly, once the wave crashes, your AD carry will have their own timing. They can use this timing to ward or clear wards or roam with you or just recall. Again, since they don't have to be in lane, this gives you the roam timing. In this case, you can see how the enemy Tristana is pushed up mid and low on health. Two markers that a gank is possible. So he looks to gank mid. Unfortunately, he's only able to land a bit of damage and get Tristana's W cooldown but you can see how this was completely free for him to try as his AD carry recalled and so wasn't even in lane. Another thing you need to be aware of is this push into roam tactic can also be used in conjunction with a recall timing. For example, here we see Moham on Rel. The sequence starts with him controlling the forward rush as we taught earlier, which allows him to get a winning engage on the enemy Rakan. They then push a wave and Moham looks to recall off it. However, remember when you crash a wave, it will mean it will rebound back and push towards you. This means his Cho'Gath can always pivot into playing safe and waiting for the wave to bounce back to the safety of his tower. So by default, Moham will always run towards mid in this position and check all the lanes. That way he keeps his options open to roam anywhere he needs to. He looks top and spots Jax engaging. Pushed up the lane while low in health. All good signs it's gankable. So he heads top to gank it. The enemy jungler ends up showing up and his own jungler shortly after. Essentially, because Moham knew he had a roam timer, it gave him the number advantage and made all the difference, getting his team two kills for one. And one thing Moham will always do if he goes for a top lane gank is that instead of then recalling, he'll just run all the way back bottom. This way he can transition gank through mid, applying more pressure, and he ends it with a return gank on his own lane, in this game getting Varus's flash. Now, let's address the elephant in the room. We all know a lot of AD carries in your own games won't play safe during these types of roaming windows, even when the wave is going to rebound back to them. Every support has had the experience of roaming, only for your AD carry to die 1v2 and then spam ping you and blame you for their death. But I want to introduce a thought that might change your mentality. You see, if your AD carry was bad enough to walk up in a lane, 1v2 and die, and is unable to recognize that you're roaming or that the wave is pushing back to them, it might be that your AD carry is also bad enough that you can't rely on them to carry the game, even if you get them a lead in lane. Basically, you might be making an incorrect assumption that giving up roam timings that would lead to your other teammates winning is worth it in order to babysit your AD carry and prevent them from dying. Either way, you don't actually have to copy every roam timing Moham uses as some are safer for your AD carry than others. A standard push into roam mid is typically one of the safer plays since the roam will happen very fast and you'll be back in bot lane in no time. However, a more advanced roam timing such as recalling and then ganking top, you do have to realize this is a much longer window your AD carry needs to play safe and so is much more likely to result in the misplaying and dying. Basically, don't just throw out all the roam timings here if you you don't like to leave your AD carry alone, just remove the longer ones. Additionally, as counterintuitive as it sounds, sometimes leaving lane can actually be a great help for your AD carry. For example, here we see Moham on Rel crash the wave and recall. By default, we just run mid, this way we can pivot to anywhere we need based on the map state. Remember, the rebound occurred off the push, so it's pushing back to our AD carry, so we don't need to go back bot. Now, I want to show the entire map here so you realize what often happens when you roam like this. Notice how the enemy support, Rakan, was walking back to lane as normal, but as soon as they see Rel on the map roaming, they react by heading towards the fight to roam themselves. So in the meantime, we're able to pick up our team a double kill with our roam. However, take a look at bot lane during this time. We're forcing the enemy support to match our roam, which means bot lane is now a 1v1. And since we roamed off a crash, it means the enemy A to carry has to be overextended since the wave is pushing to our tower. This can set up really easy solo kills for your AD carry if they're ahead in lane. So don't always assume just because you roam, your AD carry will die 1v2. Often you'll bait a response from the enemy support, leaving them in a 1v1 with a wave pushing back to them, allowing them to both play safe if they need to or go aggressive on the push up AD carry. If you do want a safer roam timer though, try to look for ones where it's already clearly pushing towards our AD carry. For example, as Moham leaves the base on Pike, if we look bot, we can see it's already pushing towards our AD carry and close to our tower. The reason why I say this is safer compared to the rebound roam is that off a of rebound, there's approximately 30 seconds or so where the wave is still pushed up while you wait for the rebound to come into effect. This is actually the most common time your AD carry will die as they will overextend walking up the lane for last hits. If the wave is already close to your tower like this and pushing towards you, then it's very unlikely for them to die solo. Additionally, 
importantly, one thing to look out for during your roam timings is action in mid lane. In this case, as we leave the base, we can see Tristana and Jace are low on health and trading. There's a very important reason to go mid here. It's that you have to realize the enemy support also wants to roam. So if you just head back bot, you're giving them a free kill on your mid. Or in this case, they get a free kill anyways because your Jace can't wait a few seconds and lets himself be engaged on by the level two support they see in the ward. Still, you get the idea. Here's another cool trick you can do with your roam timers. So here, Moham is on Rakan and pushes a wave into recalling. As you now know, every time you crash a wave in recall, you have a roam timer since it's rebounding back. In this case, if we look at the map, you can see how there's literally nowhere to roam to. Neither his top or mid are in lane. However, Jace is extremely low in health mid, meaning he clearly will need to recall after he pushes this wave. So instead of using this roam timer to gank, he'll actually use it to hold and pull the wave mid. This not only prevents minions dying to the tower for free, but also then sets up a nice freeze right outside his tower for Zione. Now, there is actually one roam timer that Moham tries to hit literally every game, and it's roaming for the first Rift Herald spawn. The first Rift Herald will spawn at 8 minutes for those that don't know. In this game, you'll see Moham respawn, and it's 8.20 in the game. If your jungler is in position to take the Herald, hitting this roam timer before the enemy support can actually be game winning. You can see in this case, not only does Moham help his jungler take the Rift Herald, but he's then able to counter gank topside immediately after, which is the main reason why they're able to turn that into a kill for his team. There's one very important thing you need to know about the Rift Herald roam timer though, and it's that whoever one lane will have a support that's level 6 compared to the other support that's level 5. So here Moham is on Alistar, recalls at the 8 minute mark and heads to the Rift Herald. The enemy support matches the roam timer and is actually still level 4, hitting level 5 mid fight. The fact that during this 4v4, Alistar has his ultimate while Rel doesn't is absolutely massive. You can see how Rel practically can't do anything, meanwhile Alistar gets to properly frontline, tanking abilities with his ultimate, letting him be in position to land a nice two-man pulverize that wins them the fight. Here's something crazy though, the power of roaming isn't just about winning other people's lanes. Moham uses a very clever tactic with his roams called the return gank. Here you can see him and his A to carry crash a wave to recall. Again, because we crash the wave we know it's rebounding back to us. So as we leave the base you walk mid while we watch the map to see if we need to react to anything. In this case there's a fight in river between the junglers and a lot of trading mid with a really a low and our mid pushed up. Again I need to emphasize you not only have to roam here so you can get kills but it's also to prevent the enemy support from roaming and getting kills. So we head mid and are able to get there in time to help protect our team. However remember how we said by roaming off a crash we get that rebound back towards us? Well take a look at bot lane. That's exactly what happened. So Varus has pushed up the lane. This gives you a great pivot from mid to then gank your own lane. You can see how unplayable this is for Varus. Since his support didn't roam off a crash or the wave pushing back into him, and instead the enemy recon roamed while the wave was pushing to the enemy. This is very risky to do and often wrong since your AD carry will have no way to last it without being very far up the lane. Sometimes Moham will actually take this a step further and execute a return gank by predicting an enemy supports roam. For example, here Moham is recalling as recon. As he leaves base, he goes towards mid as we've taught you. Now, bot is already being pushed so his AD carry should be safe. As we move forward we see his jungler get into a fight with the enemy mid laner. Now usually we react to this, after all this is why we path through mid in the first place, is to be in position to react to any plays on the map. However there are a few things going on. Firstly his top laner just died meaning the enemy top has lane priority and can react to the fight creating a numbers advantage. Secondly his jungler has no flash up. And thirdly his mid laner has no ultimate or flash either and is also behind a level and 1000 gold. This is a pretty common scenario you're going to find yourself in. You hit a proper roam timing, a fight happened, but it's a fight you're probably going to lose. Well, since the enemy support also recalled, they're hitting a similar roam timing. So what you can do is use that against them to try and set up a gank on your own lane. If we fast forward, you can see how Moham chooses to give up reacting to the fight and instead plays for the gank on the AD carry while the enemy support is the one roaming. This sets up a very easy tower dive into then taking the tower after. And with all of these different types of roam covered, now let's talk about when not to roam as a support. The first, most standard time not to roam is if the wave is pushing towards the enemy. Here we see Moham on Alistar, he dies and then respawns. If we take a look at bot lane, the enemy pushed a wave into our tower, creating that rebound, and so it's now bouncing back towards them. We don't want to roam during these timings, as we're going to leave our AD carry in lane solo with a pushing wave. This is going to mean they'll either be in a 1v2 if the enemy support doesn't roam, forcing them to be zoned from last hits, but more likely in your games your AD carry is just going to die, or if the enemy roams with us, it will be 1v1, which can be okay if your AD carry is far ahead, but that's the exception to the rule. If your AD carry is behind, they're just going to die 1v1. So essentially, if the wave is pushing to the enemy, don't roam. If the wave is pushing back to you, you can roam. Because of these rules, usually the following scenario happens. The wave is pushing towards the enemy, so you have to stay in lane. Meanwhile, the enemy gets to roam. In these spots, you want to be very aggressive looking to engage, as any successful engage will result in a 2v1 you can easily win. Another thing you need to be very careful of or avoid altogether is actually roaming towards top lane before level 6. A big reason for this is it 
it, it will demand a lot of skill from your AD carry, even if the wave is pushing back to them. For example, here Moam is on Rel and leaves base and spots a roam timing on top. If we look bot, the wave was crashed before this and so is rebounding back to his AD carry, so in theory, this should be okay. However, because of how long it will take to get back to bot lane when you roam top, you can see how his AD carry had to know that a dive was possible and that they needed to back off the wave. So if we're being honest, this just isn't something an AD carry in your games will know to do, and so often will die if you go for a roam top this early. Another problem with roaming top early is that you're going to set yourself behind an experience, meaning you're going to hit level 6 late. This is important, as by not roaming top, you set yourself up for that level 6 spike we covered earlier. However, at the same time, it means you can hit that Rift Herald timing we talked about, being level 6 while the enemy is still level 5. So, a good general rule for you to follow is avoid roaming top pre-level 6 as a support. Alright, now let's talk about Moham's ward setups during the landing phase. The first ward Moham likes to put down is early on at the 2 minute mark right here. He does this when he's on the red team, and the enemy bot lane leashes, meaning the enemy jungler started at their red buff. He does this because it's very common in the current meta for jugglers to gank bot when they start red on blue side. They either do red, gank bot level 2, do red, then krugs, then gank bot level 2, or do red, krugs, raptors, hit level 3, and then gank bot from the river. This ward will catch ganks both from the tri brush and the river, and it lasts long enough to catch all of the ganks we just went over. Now, if he's winning lane and planning on pushing aggressively, Moam will go with this aggro ward setup. He'll use his sweeping lens to clear vision in the brush closest to him, and he'll actually control ward the forward brush and look to deny vision there. He'll then place his trinket ward on the brush next to the enemy's Krugs. This gives a ton of early information on any ganks coming his way. Now, if the control ward is getting cleared, he'll just fall back on placing one in the closer brush. However, if he has that trinket ward on the enemy's Krugs, he'll opt to place a trinket ward over the dragon wall right here, along with a trinket ward in the pixel brush in the river. This combination gives you an insane amount of super early info while protecting you from literally every gank angle. You can see how this ward setup was able to spot a ranger early enough to actually catch him before he ulted. This caused him to fail at his gank and waste his ult completely. Additionally, sometimes if he's winning lane really hard, he'll opt to place a control ward next to the Krugs instead of a trinket ward. This is again super valuable since it will reveal the enemy jungler whenever he does his Krugs and also show if he moves towards bot lane for a gank really early on. Additionally, almost no one ever actually walks into that brush, so it will rarely get cleared. Now, as the laning phase gets later, he'll look for chances of pushing his vision even even deeper with this specific setup. He'll place a pink in the brush behind red, place a trinket on the enemy red, a trinket over the wall on the Krugs, and a trinket ward in the brush next to the raptors. This effectively locks down the entire bot side jungle with vision. If you really want to take your warding to the next level though, you should definitely check out our Master in Minutes course on warding. For example, do you know what the most valuable ward in the entire game is? It's actually placing a ward here after the mid tower falls. It gives you vision of the most high traffic area in League of Legends. Sidelaners and junglers are constantly transitioning through this spot. Or how about the mechanic of residual vision? Did you know, after you clear a yellow ward, vision in the area will still last for another 5 seconds. This allows you to see the direction of the enemy after they clear your ward. Or what about this trick, when an enemy places a yellow ward, you can actually hover over the unit frame to see who placed it. Why is this so useful? Well, whenever there's a mystery ward over a wall or something like that, you can click on it, see who placed it, and pick off that squishy Sona in full confidence. Our warding course is filled with a ton of game-changing tips like these and is a must-watch for any player who's serious about improving. As always, you can check it out on our website by clicking the link in the description below. Alright, and now with the laning section over, let's talk about how Moham plays mid to late game once the laning phase ends. The first thing you need to understand is optimal lane assignments. Once it gets towards the 14 minute mark where the tower plates fall, usually at around that time a bot tower will be destroyed. It's right around this time you want to look to swap with your mid laner. This is because by putting your bot lane mid, it frees up the support to roam from the center of the map. If the mid laner actually stays, they're often tied down in mid lane unable to roam as much since they're distracted with the minion waves they have to farm. Basically, as you can see here, by swapping to mid, it means at any point you can roam, even if your AD carry is tied down with minions, letting you create a lot of picks and create map pressure. Simultaneously, if someone is weak defending the tower solo, it will set you up to tower dive with your AD carry. So get that lane swap with your mid laner. Now, once you're mid, there's one general rule Moham follows that you should copy, and that's that he often tries to play off his jungler. For example, here it's getting close to the 20 minute mark, and as Moham leaves base, you'll see instead of going towards the bot side of the map, he'll hug towards the top side. That's because that's where his jungler is currently located. This is a very easy rule to follow that will get you a lot of number advantage fights. It's just a very safe way of macroing in the mid game. You see here, he leaves base with his jungler. 
His jungler goes to his red, so we hug towards the bot side. Jungler's near mid, so we can now pressure mid. And you can see how with the jungler with us, you can be much more confident about trying to invade and put on pressure. We're poking and prodding towards the top side of the map only because our jungler is there to back us up. It then results in us following our jungler as it gets a pick on the enemy top lane. The reason this strategy works so well is that laners are often tied down to lanes in order to farm. Jugglers can farm enemy camps or have their camps on cooldown and are just much more willing to invade and move with you on the map setting up easy picks. So if you're ever feeling lost on what to do in the mid game, just look for your jungler and try to play off the side of the map that they're on. Another macro play I would constantly see Moham doing is making picks on overextended solo players in the mid to late game. For example, here Moham is on rel, his Yasuo ends up dying in the side lane bot. However, shortly after he spots Aurelia very pushed up looking to take the bot tower. These are often very easy kills if you're the one with mid control, as you can just collapse down on any overextended side laners with a teammate or two. Another tactic similar to this concept is that if an enemy tries to defend outer towers and side lanes, there's always a potential tower dive available for you. You can see Moham leaving base here, his Yasuo is pushing topside. In a ward, they spot Aurelia heading to defend the push, and immediately pings go down to tower diver. You see, a lot of players don't realize that outer towers practically offer no defense in the mid to late game. This is for two reasons. First, players outscale towers in terms of tankiness and damage, and so tower dives become much less risky. Second, these outer towers are so far off the map that it's hard for their teammates to come help them in time in order to defend the tower dive. And you don't need tons of teammates to do this. If you have a teammate that's ahead in the side lane, just check to see if there's an outer tower up. If there is, and the enemy is trying to defend their push, that's usually a really easy tower dive for you. This isn't just about getting kills though, it's about destroying that tower so your teammate that's ahead in the sideline can start pushing further, getting longer roam timings, and just in general snowballing his lead harder. Now, in terms of actually closing out games, Moham follows a very simple macro game plan. Whenever he kills the enemy jungler, or has a number advantage, he will always force a Baron over getting an inhib. You can see here, Moham's team is sieging a tower topside and are able to get a winning fight. Right now, four enemies are dead, while only one is dead for Moham. However, if you look at the waves, it would be very easy for his team to continue pushing and take an inhibitor during the enemy's death timers. Instead, he always chooses to pivot and take Baron over that free inhibitor. It makes a lot of sense once you start thinking about it. When you take an inhibitor, it will spawn super minions for you. Well, these super minions will actually deny your team gold, as they will always kill the enemy minions. This means if you don't get anything on the map while the inhibitor is down, you're the one who actually lost gold. Additionally, Baron is a neutral objective. Either team can take it. What this means is that even if you do take an inhibitor, if at any point you throw and take a losing team fight, the enemy can then take Baron right after, giving them a huge comeback opportunity. What a lot of players don't understand is that inhibitors are there to help create opportunities for your team to take objectives on the map. If you can already take the objective for free, like Baron, then take it right then and there. There's no need to take an inhibitor to then set up a future Baron play when you could have just skipped all those steps and just taken Baron straight away. Basically, always prioritize taking Baron over an inhibitor. It means less throws will happen in your games. And finally, let's go over Moham's mid to late game ward setups. On the side of the map that the enemy has a blue buff, we'll always go for these two wards. This gives the deep vision necessary to see rotation see if the enemies are trying to react to an objective you're taking, etc. For the side of the map with the enemy's red buff, he'll always go for these two wards. Exact same concept gives the deep vision necessary to see all rotations and if enemies are reacting to objectives you take. Additionally, unless you're specifically already going for a neutral objective like Dragon or Baron, in the meantime, he likes to place a control ward in one of these lane brushes in mid lane. The reason why this is so powerful is it lets you push out mid and then rotate through this brush towards the side of the map knowing the enemy hasn't spotted you. Additionally, when this control ward is used in conjunction with the two previous wards, it means you'll spot the enemy move in to try and ward, allowing you to set up easy picks. Compare that to if you don't have this brush control ward. The enemy can just quickly drop a ward in that lane brush from the lane to get vision on you. They basically don't have to take that risky route going through the jungle you have warded. All right, and there you go. You now know how to play support like a Korean challenger with a 76% win rate. Before we go though, let's address the elephant in the room, feeling of being stuck at your current rank. We all know how frustrating it can be. But what if you could take a shortcut to understanding the game on a deeper level, gaining ranks faster than you ever thought possible? Well, our subscription service not only offers the highest number of courses available on the entire internet, covering literally everything you could ever want to know about the game, but they're also specifically designed to accelerate your improvement as fast as possible. So click the link in the description below to unlock the most extensive and effective training resource you'll ever find. And that will do it for this one. We here at Skillcamped want to thank you for watching, and we'll catch you in the next one.